me start the recording so I can put this up later. And I'm going to share my screen with you all. It's going to take me a second to get this up. All right. Here we go. So the topic of the day is how to take advantage of the greatest real estate investment opportunity in a decade. Now, this is going to be a multi-part series. Today is the, the opportunity around the corner. I'm going to talk about why, where we are now and where I think we're going and why I see a big opportunity coming up right around the corner. Part two is going to be tomorrow, which is how you're going to find deals once this great opportunity presents itself. And part three is going to be about getting the money. It's a topic I'm sure everybody wants to learn more about. So always, all the recordings are going to be available in the Multifamily Investment Community Group on Facebook. If you haven't joined, please join us on Facebook. All you have to do is search for that group and uh, ask to be let in and promise not to spam and you'll be in. We're going to do some Q&A at the end of this session uh, here live on Zoom. If you're in the Zoom uh, webinar, you can do Q&A with me live. Put your questions into the chat box. I can't see any questions right now because of the way the, sh the screen share works, but put your questions into the question and answer box and I will answer them at the end of the presentation. If you're in Facebook, you won't be able to ask questions live during the show, but you can put them into the Facebook chat and I will answer them afterwards, okay? Promise. I'm also going to give you an opportunity to join my multifamily launchpad mentoring program, which I'll explain at the end. And that is going to help you to put into practice what you're learning today and tomorrow and Wednesday uh, on these sessions. So the opportunity around the corner. Now, if you're older than about 25 years old, you probably remember that in the early 2000s, real estate prices absolutely skyrocketed. They skyrocketed to levels never before seen in history. And at the time, there were a lot of prominent real estate developers or real estate cheerleaders, I should say, who were saying, you know, there's no bubble. There's a new paradigm. Prices always rise in a strong economy. There's nothing unusual about this. And in 2006, real estate prices reached an all-time high. The cheerleaders were just gloating that they were right. I told you so. Then in 2007, you remember what happened, right? The United States experienced the greatest real estate crash since the Great Depression. The prices of both residential properties and commercial properties just plummeted. It caused the Great Recession and millions and millions of people lost their jobs and homes. Well, if you remember that, or even if you don't, I want to show you something that really should set your teeth on edge if you're trying to break into real estate right now. Now, this is from Green Street Advisors Commercial Property Price Index. And it's absolutely scary if you ask me. Now this is what the price index looks like for the crash of 2006, 2007. 100 is the price at the peak, okay? And you can see below it's half cut off. 61 was where it dropped to. So basically it was almost a 40% loss of value of commercial property during the crash. Look where we are today. This is a couple months old, this data. Uh, this is the end of 2017 but the shows you that basically property prices at the end of 2017 were almost 25% higher than at the peak. And they've been plateauing for a while. I checked out the recent data today uh, and they just released something uh, this month and it says we're actually at 126.9. That's the all time high ever, but it's basically kind of plateauing that you can see, but that's not the worst of it, right? That, graph I just showed you is for all commercial properties. It's an aggregate. Look at apartments. Look what's happened to apartments since uh, the crash. They are now at 40%, 42% higher than they were at the peak of the last bubble. Now, real estate gurus and cheerleaders and real estate pushers look at this data. They see markets at an all-time high and they say, look how strong the market is. If you don't get in line right now, if you, don't get, if you don't get in on this right now, you're gonna miss out. Now is the time to buy, 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 buy. But I'm here to tell you what people, what the cheerleaders and the gurus aren't gonna say, or maybe they just don't quite even understand. And that is, if you're getting into real estate now, if you were just getting in now, you are already too late. You have missed the time of great opportunity. It's already passed you by. The time of greatest opportunity was that delta between the bottom and when things evened up with the previous peak all of the appreciation has already happened in this cycle. You can see we plateaued at the top 
no more appreciation is going to happen in the cycle. And I can tell you why in a, in a couple minutes. Now, when the gurus and people see this, they look at this and say, this is the time of greatest opportunity. Well, it is for them because it's really easy to sell $40,000 coaching programs during a real estate feeding frenzy. When you know, every amateur who's ever thought of investing is trying to get into the market and good deals are impossible to find. And that allows gurus to say, hey, I've got secret deals. I'll show you my system. It's only $40,000. And then you know, when you can't find any secret deals because there aren't any out, out there, they say, well, you know, it's your fault. You're not applying the system properly. Because the guru is not going to tell you that for the smart investor, the time when the market is high right now, that isn't the time of maximum opportunity. It's actually the time of maximum risk. Now, after all, markets do not crash from the highs. They don't, sorry, they don't crash from the lows. They crash from the highs, right? You're never going to see a market that's already tanked, tank more. They tank from the top, not the bottom. And in fact, James Stack, who is an expert investor who predicted the last real estate crash is once again warning that we're in a bubble and that things are looking really, really dangerous right now. Now, at the same time, there's something else that the gurus aren't going to tell you about the situation right now. And this is actually good news. In fact, I think it's really, really good news. And that is that the best buying opportunity, at least a decade, is coming. It's getting closer every single day. And some people are going to have prepared for it ahead of time. And those are the people who will be the next ones to profit enormously from multifamily real estate. Now, I'm going to explain exactly how to do this over this video and the next two videos over the next couple of days. So be sure that you turn into all three of them. But you know, before we go on, I'm sure that there is a question in a lot of the minds of the people who are watching this video right now, this, this presentation. And it is, who the heck is this Jonathan Twombly guy? And what business has he teaching about real estate investment anyway? So let me tell you, who is Jonathan Twombly? Well, first and foremost, I'm a husband and father of two beautiful girls. I'm a big Boston Red Sox fan, a graduate of Harvard and Columbia Law School. I practice law on Wall Street for about 12 years, doing $100 million cases. I'm a real estate investor and podcaster. And I've been a professional asset manager since 2011. But, you know, back in the day when I was a lawyer, pretty much every single day on that job was like a rainy Monday morning. And I was so unhappy in those days that I actually got the Sunday night blues on Friday night, just thinking about having to go back to school on Monday. I was dying to get out of that job. And I started thinking that real estate investing might be the right way. But I was the sole breadwinner for my family. And I, even though I made a good salary at the time and I had some money saved up, I just couldn't figure out how I could ever acquire enough property to replace my income and escape from this job that I hated so much. Now, in 2011, I wound up getting lucky, but it's not the way that you think. My firm kind of ran out of work for me to do in the aftermath of the recession. And eventually I got downsized because they just didn't want to pay my enormous salary anymore. Now, getting laid off was a huge shock to me and my family, but it was also a huge wake-up call because it made me realize that a quote-unquote secure job wasn't really all that secure. And it also forced me to make a choice. Either I was going to do something about my dream of becoming a full-time real estate investor, or I was just going to have to shut up about it forever. And right around that time, I got very lucky. I met somebody who taught me a methodology for using other people's money to buy large apartment buildings and to make my living as an asset manager as basically as a full-time investor. Now, I struggled for a few years for sure, but in 2014, I finally put all the pieces together and I got a system that started working well for me. And within 11 months, I acquired more than 400 apartments and those apartments are now worth about $25 million. Now, you fast forward today, I've been interviewed about my success story on just about every real estate podcast there is, so a lot of you people already know who I am. And I spend my time asset managing my portfolio, following the markets, and writing and podcasting about real estate. I also help private clients who want to replicate my success to learn the skills and methodologies of asset management so they can become free and do this for a living too. Now, you know, as opposed to when I was a lawyer, I really love my life because I get to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want, especially these two. I have complete freedom to spend with these girls. You know, back when I was a lawyer, I basically missed dinner every night. I was never home at all. Now, not only am I home at night with these kids, but 
I'm there at all their school stuff. I never miss anything because I have complete freedom over my time. And if I'm busy, I just work later, but I can adjust my time the way I want. And for me, that's what freedom really means. So what does all this have to do with you? Now, I've been following the markets very closely for 10 years, even since before I became a professional real estate investor, which was about seven years ago. And this is what I see. Now is the optimal time to start preparing for the opportunity of a decade. Now, for me to explain why this is, we need to go into a little bit of education about market cycles. Now, I wanna introduce you to this concept. Uh, market cycles were first sort of uh, uncovered or recognized, I guess is the best word, by Professor Glenn Mueller. And let me sort of take you through his schematic for, for how market cycles work. Now, the diamond that's mark number one, which you see there, that's the start of a new cycle. This is the recovery phase. At this point in the cycle, vacancy is at its all-time high. Now, it's a little counterintuitive because it's below, you see this long-term occupancy average. Anything below that means high vacancy. Anything above it means low vacancy, okay? So the market has probably gone through a big round of foreclosures uh, by investors who bought at the top of the market, and they couldn't sustain a drop in occupancy, which is what happened. From diamond one, you start entering into this recovery phase. And what happens during that phase is that new construction from the previous cycle has finally stopped. And as you're getting population growth, you're starting to slowly chip away at that high vacancy rate. And you're getting closer and closer to that long-term occupancy average. During this phase, banks are still a bit too skittish to lend, but what you see is the smart money start moving in uh, as it's starting to, to find some deals and starting to get a little more confident again uh, about getting into the markets again. Now, diamond six represents the point where the market reaches that equilibrium point of occupancy or the historical occupancy point, I should say. So this is where you've chipped away through population growth and maybe an improving economy at that you know, high occupancy problem and you're back down to the average long-term. Once you cross that line, you're moving into the expansion, expansion phase and that's when occupancy really starts to decline and this starts giving lenders more confidence about building. And what they do is they start lending a lot of money now to developers. Investors also start flooding the markets. And what you start seeing is you climb up, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, you start to see some of the early investors cashing out. They've already made a quite a bit of appreciation profit on their deals. They're cashing out. And what that does is actually pulls more new investors into the market because they see the early entrants selling. They want to get in on it. Their, their greed starts playing on them, their fear of missing out starts playing on them, and they also don't, and they assume that the market is just gonna keep on going up and up and up. They don't understand cycles. At some point, you hit point 11, where uh, the occupants, the, the amount of new product that's being built is equal to the amount of new renters entering the market. Uh, and you wind up at this equilibrium stage where basically you're absorbing everything uh, demand is not building anymore, but you're not oversupplying the market yet. You're at this perfect equilibrium point. Then you enter into the phase three, which is hyper supply. And that, what happens there is all of that lending that started happening after point six, all of the, that new product that started coming online, well, there's a long lag time for that to come onto the market. And that exceeds point 11. There's still supply coming onto the market. But what's happening now past point 11 is that it's coming onto the market too fast to be absorbed, you're not having the same amount of population growth or new renter growth that you were having before. So now the supply is actually exceeding the demand. And what you get at this point is uh, you're still having rent growth, but rent growth is decelerating. So the rate of rent, rent growth is slowing down. What happens in this point of the market, according to Dr. Mueller, is that a lot of people miss it. They think, oh, it's still going up because we're still getting rent increases. But what's actually happening is people are not recognizing the deceleration and they're missing the turn in the market. And a lot of people are continuing to buy at this point, but they're really buying in what they don't realize is, a, is the beginning of the downslide. Um, finally, at some point, you get so much oversupply that you reach point 14, where you're back down to the long-term average of occupancy. And when you tip past that point, you get into recession. And where you, this is where you've got, uh, your vacancy is, 
is really <clears throat> cranked up high, but it's, it's starting to decline a little bit because the rate of um, new construction is dropping off. And what happens at this point is buyers and sellers cannot agree on price. Buyers are still caught up in the idea that they're going to get the high prices from the peak. Sorry, the sellers are still caught up looking, uh, trying to get the high prices from the peak. The buyers are looking at the reality and saying, this makes no sense. I'm not paying for that. There's too much risk in the market. I'm sitting, I'm sitting back. And liquidity almost disappears from the market. It's very hard to have transactions happen at this point. And finally, you get back to point one again, which is where you have the peak of, of occupancy. And once you pass that peak and you start having declining op occupancy, sorry, declining vacancy and increasing occupancy, then you go back into the recovery phase again. So where are we now? Well, Dr. Mueller is still active and he puts out a report every quarter, which you can get from uh, Black Creek. I believe it's called Black Creek. And actually, I have it right here. I'll tell you. Hold on. You can get it from Black Creek Group. Yes. They have a research report that they put out every month. If you want to get it for free, you can have it at a one, si a one quarter lag. If you want to pay for it, you can get it as it comes out. This is the most recent free one. And what it shows is that of the 54 markets that Dr. Mueller covers around the country, every single one of them is at the peak or past it. That's every single one. There's not a single market that's still in the expansion phase. Everything is equal, either at perfect equilibrium or moving into hyper supply. And Oklahoma City looks like it's even gonna tip into recession soon. Now, because we're in this hyper supply or at almost at hyper supply in every single market, I wanted to actually read you what the description of that is according to his research or according to his, uh, his definition. So hyper supply phase three of the real estate cycle commences after the peak equilibrium point 11 is passed where demand equals supply growth. That's peak, that's point 11. Most real estate participants do not recognize this peak passing as occupancy rates are at their highest and well above long-term averages, there's a strong and tight market. There's no painful oversupply during this market because new supply completions compete for tenants in the marketplace. Um, but as more space is delivered to the market, rental, slow, rental growth slows. Eventually, market participants realize that the market is turned down and commitments to new construction should stop or slow. If new supply grows faster than demand once the long-term occupancy average is passed at point 14, the market falls into phase four. So I think it's really important to understand that this is that hyper supply, the market looks really, really great during the hyper supply phase because rents are high, uh, de you know, demand is very, very strong still, and you're still getting rent growth, but you've passed the peak of rent growth. And that's, that's really, if you're paying attention to these things, that's the signal that you need to be looking out for. And I think what happens during this phase is a lot of the cheerleaders and a lot of the brokers are saying, you know, the rally is going to continue forever because look at that rent growth. We're still getting rent growth. Look at that occupancy. We're still getting occupancy. So not only are some investors getting misled by the, by the, 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 uh, the data, but there is a whole industry that has an interest in saying that things are great and you should keep buying. So that's something to watch out for. Okay. So, if the markets are at the peak, why are so many people still buying? Well, part of it is there's all the cheerleading going on. But another reason is investor psychology. Now, a lot of investors see other people who bought early and are making money now, and their greed makes them want to share in those profits. And in addition, their fear makes them worry that the markets are going to go even higher and they're going to be priced out forever and they can never get in if they don't get in now. Now, this is actually exactly what Robert Schiller talks about in his book, Irrational Exuberance. If you don't know who Robert Schiller is, he is the father of the Case-Shiller Index of Housing. He is a Nobel Prize winning economist and a professor at Yale. And he wrote the book Irrational Exuberance as a result of his study trying to figure out why it is that people will pay more, for, more or less for the same asset, exactly the same asset, at different points in the cycle. And he tried to explain it with data with fundamental analysis with all kinds of things and he said there's no connection what there is is psychology and what happens is feedback loops and the way that feedback loops work is they can be both positive and negative a positive feedback loop involves people seeing you know the the casual investors and the media are not paying attention to the real estate market during phase one 
Only the smart money is involved there. The smart money moves in and starts buying. They start exiting in, in phase two, and that's when the media and the casual investors start, start paying attention. And that causes a positive feedback loop as everybody now tries to pile into the market and it becomes completely disconnected from any kind of underlying fundamentals. The opposite can happen during a crash where the market starts to crash, you start hearing about foreclosures, the media gets involved and you have a negative feedback loop where people start fearing things irrationally and they're out of the market when they really should be in the markets and buying. Um, so that, that's kind of how the market psychology works. Now, while this is going on though, while people are in this really high state of exuberance about the, the, the positive nature of the market, they're making decisions very often based on emotion. And then they use facts or they use arguments to try to justify what they're doing emotionally. So one of the things that's going on right now is investors are paying record high prices and they're using a couple of different rationalizations to justify paying those crazy prices. Now, what I'm not talking about here, and I wanna make a caveat, I'm not talking about certain kinds of investors that need to be placing money. So for instance, if you have a 1031 exchange, you may need to be buying, you may have a rational reason to be buying because you now have this huge tax obligation that you're trying to avoid, so you need to find property to buy. Or perhaps you are some kind of institutional investor that has cash gener being generated by a business every single month and they need to place it. In some, in some cases, they actually may have a legal obligation, for instance, you know, an insurance company, to, to place money uh, in, in safe investments. So aside from those kinds of uh, buyers, I'm talking about everybody else. And people are using essentially two justifications for paying crazy prices. One is high rent growth, which they say justifies high prices and they project it into the future and say, this high rent growth is going to continue and that justifies me paying a high price now. And the other one is low interest rates, which make the properties cheaper to operate. But I want you to look at what's actually happening in the market right now. Now first, as Dr. Mueller has described, rent growth is declining. That's the classic uh, phase three thing that goes on, right? Rent growth has been declining since 2017 and it, it, there's no signs of it picking up anytime soon. The other thing is interest rates are rising. Now, the Federal Reserve has committed to making at least three and potentially four interest rate hikes this year and another three next year. And this is really important to pay attention to because it makes borrowing costs much, much higher, makes, makes it much more expensive to operate apartments. And it also, as I'm gonna show you in a minute, makes it harder even to get debt. Now. Once again, we have James Stack, who predicted the last crash. Uh, James Stack is saying that it was actually a series of rate, of rate increases that caused the last bubble to, to pop. And he thinks that the three rate increases that are projected for this year raise a very, very high possibility of the same thing happening again. He says it raises the risk that today's highly inflated housing market will again end badly. So why exactly are interest rates a problem? I don't think it's necessarily intuitive why this is a problem, but I want to explain why. Um, now, when cap rates go down, that means the prices go up. And as you know, you know, the cap rate is the net operating income or NOI divided by the purchase price, right? As cap rates go down and properties get more expensive, you're using the same amount of NOI dollars to cover an ever larger debt payment, right? So the higher the price goes, the harder it is to cover your debt payment. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how this works. Now, let's say you have a property, you find a property that's generating $100,000 of NOI, and you can buy that at an 8% cap rate. Now that implies a purchase price of 1.25 million. Now I'm leaving closing, closing costs and all these other things out. I just, just want to keep it very simple, okay? So that implies a purchase price of 1.25 million. Now let's assume that you have a 30 year amortization loan at four and a half percent interest. That makes your annual debt service $57,000. Now, if you calculate your debt service coverage ratio, that's what, that's what DSCR stands for. You divide $100,000 by 57,000. And again, we're making this simple, so we're not putting in you know, reserves and all the other things that banks kind of ding you for when they calculate your DSCR. Um, but just a simple DSCR, at this level, 
it's 1.75. Most banks require 1.25 times DSCR to give you a loan. So at 1.75, you're golden. And not only that, you have a lot after you pay your debt service, not are you golden in terms of getting your debt covered, but I mean, look, you've got $43,000 worth of cash to pay for CapEx and to put in your pocket. So you're doing really well on this, on this deal. Now, what happens when cap rates start going up? So let's take that same $100,000 of NOI at a 6% cap rate. Now your purchase price is almost $1.7 million. This is a $400,000 increase in purchase price for the same cash flow, right? Same exact cash flow. You're just paying more for that cash flow. Now, even at that same, that same debt, 4.5% interest at 30 year amortization, your annual debt service is now $76,000. If you divide that by your NOI, or you divide your NOI by that to figure out your DSCR, now you're down to 1.32. Now, you're still over that 1.25 threshold that the banks require, so they may lend you the money, you may be able to buy it, but you have, first of all, very little room for error at this point, uh, you know, of dropping below that 1.25, which can get you in trouble with the bank. Um, and this is going to be hard for you to make money. You've only got $24,000 now left over for you to pay for any CapEx that comes up um, and uh, for you to put money in your pocket. But what happens if interest rates go up? So same $100,000 NOI at a 6% cap rate, same purchase price, but just a one point, just a one point increase in interest with the same amortization takes your debt service to $85,000. When you calculate your DSCR for that, you're now at 1.17. You are not going to get a loan for this property without putting in more equity. You're not gonna be able to do this at 75% LTV like this example proposes, right? Um, what happens at this point in the market is that fewer people can do deals at this level of leverage, right? People start, bidding less for deals. The, when the sellers won't agree to that, it causes a mismatch in the market. And that is where the market seizes up and you have a correction. So this is how interest rates alone can cause the market to really, really slow down and, and cause it to correct. But it's not just interest rates. There are a few other things that are going on right now that lead me to think that a correction is, is imminent. One is the length of the market upswing. This has been going on since 2008. Uh, there are decreasing volumes in transaction right now. It's actually two years past the peak and there's an increasing danger of recession. And I'm going to go through each one of these points separately. So the first is the length of the upswing. Now this is not a problem by itself. I mean, there's no, nothing that says an upswing can't go on for a long time. It, there's no time limit on upswings, but it, after a point, it becomes a psychological problem. Part of it is that, this isn't necessarily psychological, this is more asset allocation, but a lot of investors that have bought a lot of real estate, they start to think, you know, I'm overweighted in real estate right now. I've bought so much real estate, it's really time for me to stop. And they're also looking at the pricing and seeing how the pricing has changed. They also have a psychological, a psychological fear, you know, the, their fear of a downturn is increasing at this point the longer it goes on because they just know that what comes up must go down. And I think you find a lot of people just starting to pull back just because of the length of the upswing, even if the quote unquote fundamentals are still in place. And you have, a, you get to a certain point where so much of the product has been traded through. You've got people who bought who are not ready to sell yet because they're still midway through their holding period, whatever. The only investors left are people doing 1031s and have to buy. The must buy investors we talked about before who have cash, they, they have to place and wild-eyed newbies who are caught up in the enthusiasm of buying property and just are you know, in that mindset of, I just have to get a deal, I just have to get a deal, and then my life will be better. Okay, volume down. This, the reason the volumes are down is, is being attributed to the bid-ask spread. Now, what that means is um, property owners are asking too much or they're asking prices for their property. I shouldn't say it's too much, but they're asking property prices that buyers are having trouble meeting. Uh, either they're reluctant to meet them because they feel it's just too much. They can't make the money they want after the buy. The banks are, are, are pushing back and not lending at those levels or whatever. Uh, but essentially sellers are greedy. 
buyers can't make the numbers work. And this is causing more buyers to pull back to a wait and see position. And this has actually been going on for a couple of years now. And I think it just, it just shows we're getting into that point in the market where it's just harder and harder for buyers to make deals with sellers. And that causes the market to, to seize up. And the third thing I see on the horizon is the danger of recession increasing. Now, a lot more economists are predicting recession in 2019 or 2020. Um, some of this has to do with interest rates rising. Uh, some people say that that alone is what's going to uh, cause the recession. But uh, whatever reason there is, the recession would affect the demand side of the supply demand equation. So when you think back to uh, quadrants three and four, where supply and demand are now out of balance, where you've got more supply than there is demand, if there's a recession, you don't necessarily have to have more supply for things to go out of balance because the demand side of the equation is going to drop off. So that could also cause uh, vacancies to rise, delinquency to rise, concessions to rise, and NOI to drop because profitability will drop. And when that happens, you know, debt only becomes available at lower valuations because you run into that same debt coverage issue that I mentioned before with higher interest rates. So any combination of these things, whether it's higher interest rates or a recession or anything that affects the profitability of apartment buildings is going to affect your ability to get debt and that is going to affect the valuations in the market. Now, if the property market were a nine inning baseball game, I think it's safe to say that we're in extra innings at that point. We're probably in the 11th or 12th inning of a tie game. And I think everybody knows what happens in an extra inning baseball game, right? You know, basically the game can suddenly end with one swing of the bat. And we don't know where that, what that swing of the bat is, but it could be any of the things that I've mentioned before in the presentation. And that's where we are right now. Now, nobody knows exactly when the game is gonna end, but this game is going to end and it's gonna end suddenly. When will it happen? I mean, people ask me this all the time, in, especially in the group. I wish I could tell you, I wish I had that crystal ball. I don't know. But the cracks are clearly showing and it's time to get ready for the correction, even if you can't pinpoint the exact timing. Now, why does this make me excited? Well, it makes me excited because of two guys named Warren Buffett and Sir John Templeton, who are legendary investors who I respect a lot. And I come back to what I'm about to show you a lot when I'm feeling a little bit down about why I can't find property that meets my expectations or you know, whether I should even be looking at all. Warren Buffett famously said, I'll tell you how to become rich. Close the doors. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. And Sir John Templeton said something very similar. He said, the time of maximum pessimism, that's you know, when everybody's saying gloom and doom, is the best time to buy. And the time of maximum optimism is the best time to sell. Now, for many years now, we've been living with, in the greed portion of this, par this paradigm, right? Um, prices have risen dramatically and profitability on new purchases is very low and risk is also very, very high. But we're about to be getting some fear and this is good because when the market drops, the people who bought at the top, they may lose some of their investments, to be honest with you. They may lose thousands or even millions of dollars as these, you know, if they get an uptick at, of, of vacancy and they've cut the line close and they've bought at a too high valuation, you know, they've got that big debt service to pay and they just can't make it because they lost a point or two of, of occupancy that may push them over the line. When the typical investor sees this happening, that investor is going to become very, very fearful. And we're going to get into that negative feedback loop. Where, more, where bad news leads to more fear and more fear leads to more people leaving the markets and that's gonna cause pro, um, prices to drop. It's gonna cause profitability on new purchases to rise and it's gonna decrease re risk in the market. I know that sounds very counterintuitive because people feel very fearful after the market drops, but that's when the risk is the least. After a big drop has happened is when, when risk is the least because the risk has been taken out of the market. Just coming back to this point about these two great investors to remind you that that risk is lowest when people are afraid to buy, right? So when the typical investor is out of the market, that's when the smart money is going to be moving into the market. 
And hopefully this smart money is going to be you. You're going to be the one who recognizes that the market is ready to start recovering again. And while other people are fearful, you are going to be greedy. So what are some of the signs that you should look for to get back into the market? Well, one is bad news about real estate in the media. When you start hearing a lot about foreclosures and how bad things are and how terrible real estate is and how it's rigged against the little guy and all those sorts of things, the average investor is going to start to get very, very afraid and competition is going to really start lessening. So this is a signal to you that uh, it, either it's time to start buying again or the time to start buying again is, is near and you should really be watching things. You also wanna be looking back to Dr. Mueller's paradigm and be looking for occupancy stabilizing and vacancies starting to drop. So you wanna be referring to this first quadrant, phase one, uh, in the recovery section. So declining vacancy, no new construction, and occupancy creeping back up towards that long-term occupancy average. You also wanna be looking for liquidity to start returning to the market, so deals starting to happen again. This is, you see phase four, you know, what happens in phase four is that buyers and sellers can't meet at a price because sellers are asking too much and buyers are too cautious. When you see sellers having gotten a dose of reality again, and they start to transact at these lower prices. You know, maybe they're not selling the properties that they bought at the peak, but they're selling older properties that they, that they can take a profit on. You may see them moving. You may see the really smart sellers now actually moving and doing 1031s now on older properties because they recognize the buying opportunity and they want to free up cash to sell out of older properties and get into better properties when the valuation is great. When you see that happening, then you know the smart money is moving and you should be moving too. So you just have to remember when fear rules and the buying opportunity is here. Well, so, okay, I'm sorry. I, I sort of messed up the intro to this, but uh, what I want to say is that there is at this point in the market where there is a great amount of fear in the market. This affects everybody. It doesn't just affect it, casual investors. I mean, it can affect institutional investors. It can affect brokers. It can affect lenders it really can affect the entire market. So even if you're not feeling fearful and you're feeling that this is a great opportunity, you have to recognize that other people in the market are gonna be feeling fear. And this leads to a giant problem. And that is that when fear rules and the buying opportunity is here, then brokers, investors, and lenders may be reluctant to deal with you, especially if you're new, right? Especially if you're new. You think it's tough now in a hot market as a new investor, when you get into this this, you know, now brokers don't want to deal with you because they have better ways to spend their time and they're, they're inundated with new investors who can't close deals. So they're, they're you know, putting you off with you know, requests for proof of funds and stuff like that. That's not going to be your problem uh, when the market is great for an investor. Your, your problem then is going to be that they're just going to be dealing with fear, right? So the subject of how you solve this problem, these are going to be the subjects of my next two videos, okay? How you are going to take advantage of the time that we have now to get ready for this great opportunity to come, okay? That, so be sure to tune into those next two videos because we're going to be talking about how to get brokers and investors to be you know, part of your team, part of your platform now while interest is high so that when the real opportunity comes, you are ready to move and they are ready to move with you. Now, in a moment, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. So start those questions if you haven't already. I can't, unfortunately, like I said, I can't see what's going on in the chat box because, um, because of the screen share. But put those questions in now. Um, and while you're doing that, I just want to give you the opportunity right now. I want to tell you a little bit about my multifamily launchpad program. Now, this is my exclusive mentorship program for people who really are committed to moving forward with this career and really learning how to do things right. Now, the Multifamily Launchpad program is designed to give you all of the skills that you need to take advantage of the great opportunity to come that we were just talking about. The confidence to deal with brokers, investors, lenders, et cetera. The accountability to ensure that you're taking the steps you need to ensure success. And my personal involvement and mentoring every step of the way. We're going to cover everything you need to know from identifying the best markets to invest in, professional financial underwriting, proper due diligence to make sure you don't get stuck with a lemon, winning bids and negotiating contracts, 
qualifying for debt so that you can actually close the deal, syndicating the equity so you can raise enough equity to close if you don't have enough money to do it yourself, finding and overseeing the best property managers in the business, scaling a real estate business so you can replace your income, and everything else you need to launch and grow your real estate investment business. And you're gonna receive all kinds of stuff with this program. It's a self-paced video program with eight weeks of live group video calls with me, three personal sessions with me, a specially designed financial and analysis template so you can do very sophisticated underwriting, checklists for every single stage of the process so you never miss anything important at all, numerous subject matter expert videos from experts in the field, personal follow-up with me on your deals, a private Facebook group, the accountability to finally start moving forward, increased self-confidence from having a mentor, which is very, very important, as you know. Now, just some details about the program. It starts on August 1st at 7 p.m. Eastern. There is a full one-on-one -on -one mentoring option that's available at a higher charge, and there's also a kind of content and calls only option that's also available if the main program doesn't meet your budget. For all of these programs, there's an application and interview process that's required for the program. So you have to act fast. The interviews are gonna end on Friday. Everything is, you have until Sunday to make up your mind, but you only have till Friday to interview with me. Time and spots are very limited. So please don't miss out on your chance to join this. Um, now, of course, why now? This is a big question. Why would you do this now? And you all, you all know that my view on the market is, it is not the time to buy. Well, as I said, I really, really, truly believe that the greatest opportunity in the decade is right around the corner. And if you're not prepared for it, it's going to be too late. I personally am spending my time getting my ducks in a row so that I have dry powder available to me when the buying opportunity is right. I'm actually about to embark on a big campaign with my investors and to get new investors to bring them on board so that when the time is right, we can really move and make a big dent in this thing because that's when the money is going to be made. Now is the time to be learning the skills and making the relationships and getting your team together that you need to move fast. And I feel very strongly about this because I really got, want you guys to have success. I mean, I, I'm tired personally of all of the rah-rah stuff out there about you have to buy a deal now. And, and I see people making dangerous and bad decisions and it kind of pains me. I want you guys to make better investment decisions. I want you to be ready for this great opportunity that's coming up. And now is the time to do it. You know, not once you recognize that a recovery has started, it's going to be too late. Those brokers aren't going to pay attention to you then. You need to be cultivating them well in advance. You need to be cultivating the money sources well in advance. You need to be explaining to investors why it's a great opportunity because many of them are going to be in fear too. So if you wait till the recovery be begins, it's going to be too late. The time to act is really right now. So how do you join? You can fill out an application today by going to this URL. I suggest you take a quick screenshot of this and I'll leave it up for a second so that you can. Uh, I'm also going to drop this into the group uh, and it's been posted in the group a number of times. So be sure to go there, fill out an application today so that you don't miss out on this window, which is closing on Friday. Uh, so please hurry up. Don't miss out. And now we will do Q and A on any topic that you like. I'm going to stop the screen share so I can see questions and I'm happy to answer any questions that you like. Okay, so in the chat. So Satish says, should we not get deal into deals right now? So I would not say do not get into deals right now because that would be absolutist and I don't believe in absolutes. What I think is that you need to be very careful about getting into deals right now. Good deals are very hard to find. People are still buying, but I think a lot of people are buying bad deals and they're doing it based on underwriting that really stretches uh, the truth. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily doing things um, intentionally wrongly, but I think in their exuberance, they rather than, you know, what you should be doing when you're underwriting is underwriting to the return that you want, and then you bid the price that's going to get you that return. What's happening now is that a lot of people are figuring out what the price is that they need to buy, right? That they need to bid to get, they're talking to the brokers, finding out what the whisper price is. They're bidding that price and then they're adjusting their underwriting to, to get to the return that they need, right? And, and that's, that's very dangerous. So don't do that. Also, if you are buying a deal now, you really need to stress test it and assume that we're going to have a recession 
in the next couple of years and really make sure that you can withstand, you know, a 10% vacancy for a year uh, that you're not going to go into foreclosure if that happens, right? Or, and you can still, you know, make, uh, make your debt service, obviously, but also you want to be adequately reserved. You want to make sure you've got a big reserve fund on hand so that if you can't pay for capital items that come up out of cash flow, you have the money there because otherwise, you know, you're going to be making a capital call on your investors or, or doing it yourself. This is really kind of dangerous. And, and, you know, the irony there too, is if you have a big reserve fund that you've reserved ahead of time, that means more equity into the deal. The deal. It means lower returns. It means the temptation to push your underwriting even more is, uh, is there, you know, it's even stronger. So a lot of factors can come into play that, that cause people to loosen their underwriting. I also want to have a, I also want to have a, um, I also want to have a uh, like a word for the passive investors who are on the call. There are some things that you guys should be watching out for specifically if you're looking at passive deals right now. One is that in order to get to say a high teens or low twenties IRR on a deal, Sponsors have to, you know, in addition to pushing their cash flow underwriting, they're also pushing their exit cap rates. And what that means is that they may be assuming that the market is going to be as hot when they exit as it is now. They should be assuming on their, uh, on their exit that they're going to be exiting into the average, you know, the historical average cap rate for that asset class in that market, rather than following the rule of, you know, exiting a point higher than they went in. That's kind of a classic underwriting uh, to, uh, rule of thumb, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's meant for when you're bidding on a deal in a normal market. If you're bidding on a deal in an extremely hot market like today, and say you're buying at a five cap, the idea that you're going to exit in five years at a six cap, I think is a really dubious proposition. So you should be looking at what the exit cap rates are. You should be looking at the ratios. You know, if you're looking at like a 1970s product, uh, a very, very good expense ratio. So the ratio of expenses to revenues is a very good one is 45%, right? Um, I've seen people underwriting deals at like 35% on, on deals that, um, you know, 1970s deals, 100 unit deals. I mean, it's, not, it's just not gonna happen. So you need to be careful about those things when you're, when you're looking at deals. Um, it's very, very important. So just be cautious. Cautious is the words, the, caution is the words of the wise these days. Okay, so Benjamin says, I'm about to become a 1031 investor. I want to sell my single family house and roll the profits into a syndication. I've not yet listed the house. Given that we're on the verge of a correction, would you recommend that I not sell the single family house? I feel there may be some pullback with the value of single family, which is why I want to sell now. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, you have to, first of all, check with a lawyer about whether you can roll into a syndication. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure how that works. So check with somebody to make sure that you're actually able to do that. But in terms of selling the single family house, yeah, I mean, if you think the market is gonna correct, then sell it. I mean, you can never time the market perfectly. And, and what I, and I hear, so the market timing argument made a couple of ways. Like one is, oftentimes it's made as like a, a comeback to people who say, well, the time to sell is now. They say, well, you can't sell the market as if that means you shouldn't, that you can't time the market as if that means you shouldn't sell. You should sell when you are making enough profit that you're happy with the profit you're making. And if you think that the market is ripe for selling, right? So you want to sell into a hot market. You don't want to try to sell into a bad market. So if you think it's time to sell, then yeah. And maybe you miss a couple of points on the upside. But, uh, you know, data, there has been a study on this, which I, I'll try to find. But it shows that selling too, or waiting too long is worse than selling too early, right? So you miss more profit by waiting try, to try to wait until the market is perfectly timed and, and then sell than you do if you sell it a little bit short of the market. Um, so it's better to sell if you think it's time to sell. Okay, let's see. Ankit says, uh, would you recommend to sell Sacramento single family house and do a 1031 exchange into a different market? Um, so, Yes and no. Um, yes, yes, because you could get a better cap rate on the, um, you know, you could get a better cap rate in a different market. But you have to, 
also recognize that there have been tons and tons and tons of investors flooding into smaller markets from places like New York and California. And what's often happened is that, you know, just pulling some numbers out of the air, let's say they're selling at a five cap in California or New York, and they're buying at an eight cap in some small Midwestern city. And they think, oh boy, that's great. I'm getting an eight cap. And what they don't realize is that that market should be trading at a 15 cap, right? The only reason it's trading at an eight is because all these people have flooded in from New York and San Francisco and what have you. So if you're going to do that, it's really important to understand what that local market is and don't just compare it to the market that you're in. Um, that's the same mistake, you know, that you hear people making when they move from, you know, they, they move from New York City to some small town and then they go and, you know, pay an overinflated price for a house that in that market, because what they don't realize is that, you know, that, that house is just too expensive for the market. So the same thing can happen in, um, in, in this kind of environment. And, and yes, for 1031 lawyers, um, Maurizio Raul, Raul from uh, Premier Law Group, who's a member of this group, you can reach out to him. Um, Jillian Sadati is in the group also. You can reach out to her for 1031 advice. Um, those people are excellent resources. So let's see. I just found a bunch of questions from Robert. He put them in a Q&A box. Thank you, Robert. Let's see. Uh, oh, here's, so let's see. Greg Bonds asks, is it smart to take a home equity loan now and hold the money till the crash to use at that time? I'm assuming that will be at higher interest rates at that time at well. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I don't, to be honest with you, I'm not big on taking on debt in general. Um, and, I, you know, you have, you're taking on more risk when you're taking on more debt. So just because the interest rates are cheaper now doesn't necessarily mean that this is a good idea. Um, you don't know how long it's going to be until you can find a place to buy. I don't, you know, like I said, the market's been teetering at the top for a while. It's going to correct, but nobody can say exactly for sure when it is. So um, I don't know. I'd be a little bit wary about doing that. Robert asks, will interest rates decline after the crash? My guess would be yes, because, you know, historically what you see the Fed doing is, using monetary policy to try to get us out of a recession. So if we have another recession, they'll probably lower interest rates again in order to, um, to jumpstart things. Um, but I wonder, I think there's going to be a fight at the Fed, to be honest with you, because I think after spending all this time with super low interest rates and, um, you know, finally getting interest rates back, something like approaching normal again, there's going to be some reluctance to immediately drop back down to the interest rates that we saw. Um, I think it would also depend on how bad the recession is. I think if it's, it's kind of a run of the mill recession, then uh, they won't be as aggressive as, as if it's a major, major crash. So um, that's, that's my guess about what's to happen. Um, let's see. Um, Is it better to bypass banks and concentrate on private investors and private investment fund funders? I assume you're, that's what that question is. I guess it's up to you. I think the private people often charge more interest. So you know, bank rates can be better. It just really depends on the deal. Um, that seems to be all the questions we have right now. Anybody else want to drop, drop questions into the chat? It's easier for me to see them there um, rather than the Q&A. I should have mentioned that before. Um, if you've got any more questions, let's drop them into the chat. Otherwise, I'll wrap this up and go over into the Facebook group and see what's going on over there. Um, any markets you're watching for after the drop, says Jason. Well, I'm going to still focus on the markets that I focus on now, and which is the Southeast. And the reason for that, it, it's not going to change with the recession um, or a correction, is that the fundamentals in terms of population growth are very strong there. I'm a little bit worried about what happens in a recession to the areas that are really heavily manufacturing dependent, or if we get into a trade war, you know, what happens to those markets um, if we start getting, a, you know, tariffs hiked up because a lot of them, like say South Carolina, where I invest is very export dependent. So that could be a problem. But, you know, once we weather a recession and weather a trade war or whatever's coming, 
the the fundamentals are still really strong in terms of population growth. Um, so that would keep me interested in those markets. And I would still be looking in areas like that rather than the coastal, you know, the major coastal cities where the cap rates tend to be more compressed just because there's more money to be made. But you just have to be going in at the right time. All right, any other questions? Frank, let's see. Well, thank you very much. Um, Glad you guys enjoyed that presentation on market cycles and feel free to continue asking questions. Um, you should also go to the, uh, the Black Creek group and get that, those updates from Professor Mueller. You can just read through the whole, it's, very, it's pretty simple to understand actually, um, but they've got a really good synopsis of how that works if you haven't seen it already. So I definitely recommend going and getting that. All right, if there's nothing else, then I'm gonna head over to the Facebook group. Once again, if you're interested in the Multifamily Launchpad program, you have until Friday to get onto my calendar so we can talk and see if this is really right for you. Um, I'm sure you're really gonna like it. The students who've been through the program before have had nothing but good things to say about it. You can see testimonials if you go to that URL um, for past students, see how they enjoyed the program. Um, but as always, I'll see you in the group and look forward to answering your questions there. So take care.